All right. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for gathering here today for another wonderful talk and presentation by a lovely lady here, Rachel Waddell. Um, she is Partnerships Director at Give Directly, uh, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to transforming lives of world's poorest citizens by focusing on the direct uh, delivery of unconditional cash transfers. Um, Rachel is responsible for Give Directly's fundraising relationships with bilateral and multilateral governments and philanthropic foundations around the world. Prior to this, Rachel worked as the head of strategic partnerships with Overseas Development Institute, and she's also worked in various other organizations with a focus on climate change and green economic growth, including the New Climate Economy and the Global Green Growth Institute in South Korea. Um, Rachel has got an MA in East Asian Studies from the University of Leeds and a BA in History from the University of Nottingham. Um, today in her talk, Rachel will be exploring the potential of cash transfers as a scalable solution to eradicating pover poverty in entire nations. Please give her a huge round of applause, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. And uh, thanks all for being here. It's so, it's so nice to have the chance to come and talk to you. So um, thank you for the time and to... Uh, hear some of our latest thinking around cash transfers and where we can go from what we've we've done to date um, at Give Directly. Um, I'm going to assume that most people in the room know about Give Directly and, and broadly what we do, but in summary for those of you who might not, we're an organization, an international organization that's focused exclusively on the delivery of unconditional cash transfers, so that's no strings attached cash transfers, largely via mobile money. And we've worked across 13 countries to date, primarily in sub-Saharan Africa, and we've reached directly just shy of about 1.5 million people. We're now looking back at the last kind of 10 plus years, and we're looking at the operational learnings that we've, we've had during that time, and we're reflecting on these alongside the evidence base, both that Give Directly has, has developed on its own programs, but also on cash transfers more broadly. And we're looking at this also in the context of current trends on global aid and the, the, the trajectories of those, as well as the uh, global trajectories around extreme poverty. And we're asking ourselves and others um, whether cash transfers could end extreme poverty or, at minimum, bring about substantial improvements in the rates of extreme poverty globally. There are now... 670 million people living in extreme poverty in the world today. And this is, this is up from 645 million in 2019. We, were, we had a good trajectory on extreme poverty. Rates were falling, and then with the dual impact of COVID-19 and the impacts of climate change, these numbers are going up. We're now looking to miss the SDG 1 goal of eliminating extreme poverty by 2030 by a considerable margin. Current estimates are that 570 million people will still be living in extreme poverty by 2030. And, and what is extreme poverty? So the World Bank defined this as those living on under $2.19 per person per day. But it's hard for us to really understand, I think, what that means. So we should think about extreme poverty as a state where uh, basic human needs are severely unmet. So this is lack of access to food, lack of access to water, shelter, education, all of those basic needs. Child stunting rates. Child stunting rates in Malawi and Rwanda are over a third of children under the age of five. Life expectancy. This, this picture is one of our recipients, uh, Patricia, in Malawi. And as you can see, whether you can see the caption to this, this is where her family of six were living in this hut. So this is just a bit of a, a sense of what extreme poverty actually looks like. So how is it that not only have we failed to uh, eradicate extreme poverty, but we've actually failed to make any meaningful progress on this at all, despite trillions of dollars going in to poverty reduction efforts globally over the past years. So again, if we take the example of Malawi, where Patricia is, over the past two decades, about $19 billion has been spent on poverty reduction in Malawi. 
and yet the percentage of the population living in extreme poverty now is higher than it was previously. So something, something's going wrong here. And there are multiple reasons for this. One of them is increasingly spoken about in forums such as this, but also more broadly, and that's around the long-standing challenges with the aid sector. So this is around efficiency, and this is around effectiveness. So we all know donor governments, uh, they pass, pass their funds through to experts who devise complicated programs that are designed to address the, uh, the needs as they see them of these people, individuals living in extreme poverty. But as they're doing this, they're spending huge percentages of the, of the available budget along the way. And a lot of these interventions, not all, but a lot of these interventions are still unproven or even worse, they have been disproven. Um, the second one, however, uh, additionally, there is a real problem around disillusionment. I think those with the power to change this have become really disillusioned at whether there, there is any real option to be able to do this. However, <laughs> we're now asking the question, based on what we know about cash transfers, as to whether cash transfers can provide a real opportunity to make a difference on these numbers at significant scale. And I'm going to give you the hypothesis on why I think this is possible. So first of all, we can afford to do this. You may have seen these numbers before. But the amount needed to close the poverty gap, this is an estimate from the Brookings Institute, is $100 billion per year. So this is the amount it would take to get everybody above that $2.15 line per day. And, and this sounds like a huge number, for sure, for sure. It's a huge number. However, donor governments last year spent over $200 billion on, on aid. At the same time and in the same vein, $100 billion is equal to about uh, or less than 1% of current global billionaire wealth. Some other fun facts or statistics on this <laughs> are that this poverty gap is the equivalent of 23% of what the world spends each year on coffee, and it is 80% of how much the world spends each month on alcohol. So it sounds like a big number, but it's, it, in this general scheme of things, it's not so high. Secondly, we've now got the technology to be able to do this. So through the delivery of cash transfers over the years, we've seen that there is a highly scalable, highly efficient, secure, and very rapid way to, to get support to those who need it most. This is primarily through mobile phones, and specifically, this is mobile money, which has spread rapidly across Africa and Asia, and there's now 1.2 billion registered users of mobile money in the world. We're now combining these with big data approaches, with technology, with machine learning, to this is mobile phone metadata, satellite imagery, these kind of things, combining that with existing poverty data in order to enable accurate and highly, highly scalable approaches to identifying, targeting, and getting aid to all of those living in extreme poverty. And this scalability is really, really critical. There are other highly impactful interventions at a small scale. However, many of these really struggle to retain that same impact as they scale. Many projects are working, they're highly impactful in a specific setting or with a particular leader or with a particular team around them, but trying to get this to reach the hundreds of millions living in extreme poverty doesn't, doesn't work. COVID-19 went some of the way to demonstrating the impact of cash transfers or the potential of cash transfers in this way. During COVID-19, almost every country in the world instigated some form of cash transfer program to support its citizens. And this is based on the recognition that cash transfers can support um, single parents, uh, those working in the informal economy, those in rural, rural areas, all of those suffering in myriad ways through the COVID-19 restrictions. Thirdly, this is the evidence, and we know this. I'm sure all of you in this room have, have heard about the evidence on cash transfers uh, many, many times. There's over 300 studies to date, and cash, making cash the most, if not one of the most, um, studied development interventions that there are. 
And these studies show time and time again that cash transfers can have real improvements across a number of outcomes. So they improve nutrition, they improve income, they improve women's empowerment, they can improve uh, education, psychological well-being, stunting, child mortality, a number of all across these different, different outcomes. And every time we conduct a rigorous evaluation, we find out more about what cash transfers can do. So they do more than we ever thought, th thought they did. One critical area here is that cash improves more than just the individual's lives that it's targeting. So a recent study that we'd done or, or uh, in independently conducted on one of GiveDirectly's programs in Kenya looked at the impact of giving $1,000 to 10,000 recipient households and looked at the impact on the surrounding communities, so including those who didn't receive cash transfers. And what this study found is that for every $1,000 given, it created $2,500 in the local economy, so a 2.5 bang for your buck, if you like. And there was essentially no price inflation. This was studied very carefully as well, in case that's a, a concern for folks. So when we look at this, imagine the potential impact of this if you were able to give every single adult living in extreme poverty, so under that $2.15 poverty line in a country, a, a cash transfer. 15 million people, for example, living in extreme poverty in Malawi, imagine what the impact might be if we were able to do that at a national scale. These funds are spent in really unique, diverse, personal, targeted ways. Individuals are able to spend the cash transfers on the way that best meets their particular needs. And the, the things on the things that are preventing them from escaping persistent extreme poverty. So this could be that they are sick, this could be that they lack inputs in a particular business, this could be that their children are lacking in education, that they've been set back by a particular shock. And what we see through our programs <coughs> is that cash is a able to do this, is able to touch on all of these different areas in a way that no other NGO or no other um, development intervention is able to do at scale. So this is the hypothesis <laughs> as to why making a sub substantial impact on persistent rates of extreme poverty might be possible. Let me now talk to you a little bit about the how. So as I mentioned, we've been preparing for this. We as Give Directly, but we as the world, even, even without knowing it, we've been preparing for it. Um, we've really honed the cash delivery model, and we know that this can now scale. This is safeguarding at scale, it's fraud prevention at scale, it's targeting at scale. We know how to do this. And we've got plenty of evidence, and we've got tried, tested approaches for monitoring and evaluation that can make this work. The final piece in the puzzle was this, was this targeting. How do you, in the absence, the frequent absence of reliable government data on those living in poverty, how do, you, how do you go about finding them? And these approaches that I mentioned before, using big data, using machine learning, using the, the poverty data that is there, are allowing us to do this. The next step, then, is to roll this out in an entire region. So reaching upwards of 500,000 people or a million people. Uh, in a particular region of a country, and monitoring, learning, adjusting this in real time as we go. Then, taking this to a national level. So this is where we're talking about delivering upwards of a billion, two billion, three billion dollars to, to reach every single person living in extreme poverty in a particular country. We believe that through that, there is potential to demonstrate a model of substantially reducing the rates of extreme poverty that can really have an impact on poverty reduction approaches globally. As we've said, this is both operationally feasible and ultimately, it's affordable. So, this is where we, we are today. We have the evidence, we have the model, we have the tech stack, That's, that is, we have the platform ca for cash delivery, and we now have the ability to find, target, deliver cash to the extreme poor in every region. The next prerequisites for this, of course, are government buy-in critically from the top of governments, but also throughout all of the layers of governments, regional governments, local governments, across the national government, <coughs> and the funding. 
We need to convince first movers to take a chance on this, to allow us to start, to pilot, to learn and to adapt, while engaging so closely with those who really who have the funds, those billionaires or those donor governments that have the funds to really be able to do this at, at scale. And then the final piece of this, and, uh, and this should be given a presentation of its own, but, but here we are. The final piece of this is to be working closely with government systems throughout, so that at the end of the program, governments have a strong, a robust, a reliable, a sustainable social protection system of their own to enable, ensure that if recipients have setbacks, if there are shocks that hit a particular country, the systems are there to provide ongoing support. So, in conclusion, now is the time to see if we can do a really, really ambitious project at a national scale, reaching every single adult living in poverty with, with a large cash transfer. We not only have the wealth, the technology, and the evidence base to do this, but we also have the moral obligation. Giving people cash is respectful, it's reliable, it's replicable, and it's scalable and it presents a real opportunity, a real chance of transforming entire countries and ultimately providing a plausible pathway to ending extreme poverty. Thank you very much. What a fantastic talk. Thank you so much, Rachel. Right, um, and I'm sure that you guys might have some questions. Do we have time for questions? Can we take some questions? Yeah, okay. Do you have any live questions right now? Anyone for any questions? Yes. Yes, I was just curious. How large a one-time donation do we need to lift someone out of extreme poverty? <laughs> It's, it's a really, really good question that we think long and hard about what we, what we would propose. So our standard programs are usually around $1,000. And this is where the, the bulk of the evidence on GiveDirectly's programs, this is, this is what it's based on. So we really, we know the impacts of $1,000. Um, we can kind of play around with those numbers to some degree. There's no hard and fast science on it. However, in studying the evidence base that we do have, we think that that, $1,000 per household, so it works out about, $500, $500 per adult is potentially the sweet spot to, to get the impacts that you want. However, there, there's, a, there's a long debate on this. Yeah. Yeah, that was a good. Is it on? Oh, it's on. And um, that was a great talk, thank you. Um, increasingly, we're seeing cash combined with other interventions together, so like cash plus assets plus like resilience yeah. training, etc. From all the research that you've done, do, do you have evidence of kind of which people are able to kind of make the most of their cash transfer? So if you're giving everyone the same amount, how can you help them to kind of get the most value from it? Yeah. Because some people must get a lot of benefit and others probably don't spend it as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a really critical and very, um, very live question. Um, of course, there are complementary interventions that we know to be to be highly effective. There are also, Give Directly has done um, a number of um, benchmarking studies, some of you may know in this, where we've looked directly at the at the impact of cash versus a kind of traditional complementary intervention. And one of these looked specifically at youth workforce readiness, so employment and entrepreneurship, and actually found that combining the two doesn't give you kind of additional impact. Actually, both are sort of... So, so there is a bit of a debate around this. We are looking um, in various programs at seeing how... Uh, what are the kind of key criteria that enable somebody to do better uh, with cash transfers? Generally, we would see different outcomes. You know, I think it's no surprise to, to, to see that um, if you give cash transfers to somebody who has just completed an employment and entrepreneurship training, you may see a, a greater increase in, in income than if you're giving it to a mother with children under the age of two or something. So, so we do, we do um, see differences like that. How to get the perfect combination, <laughs> this, is, this, is the critical, this is the critical question. And I don't have the perfect answer, but it's something that we are considering through, through um, our various programs, how we might get a, learn more around this. 
um, without, you know, inflating the cost of the entire intervention so so hugely. It's yeah, it's the question. <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you for, for, your, for the information. It was very interesting. Um, do you have put any limitations on what the money can be spent? No, no, we don't. Yeah. And this is really at the core of um, Give Directly's model and approach to cash transfers. There are cash transfer programs that are restricted. So, um, you know, this can look like vouchers that you can spend in certain shops or they're conditional. So you get a cash transfer if you send your child to school and Give Directly very intentionally doesn't do that. It's unconditional. And this is really based on the on the, the fundamental belief that those individuals know better how to improve their lives than, than we can predict sat in London or New York or Stockholm or whether, wherever it is that we are. So no. Thanks. Uh, any more questions? <laughs> if I may have a follow-up. Um, so is there a risk that money will be spent on things that are completely mm. useless? It, uh, it, it yeah, interesting. So, so through this, these 300 plus studies, everybody is trying to um, uh, look at this question of like, don't people just waste it on booze and cigarettes? And and and, uh, and the conclusive evidence across those studies is that no, they no, they don't. You will always find some, of course. You will find some people spending a small fraction on something we may, I don't know, disapprove of. However, generally, people in poverty have a very clear idea of what they're going to do with that money and they use it incredibly incredibly well um there's also a um it, it talks to this question around who determines useful and useless do you know what i mean so it may be that um uh if you are giving cash transfers explicitly with you really want to drive up i don't know <laughs> uh, coffee farming in a particular area well this this may not happen. In, in that case, individuals will spend it on a myriad, of, and that's sort of the beauty of the model, in a way, that it's that individuals are left to determine exactly how they can best improve their own lives. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, one last question. Then. Um, so my question is: uh, Aren't you afraid that uh, this uh, sort of solution is uh, going to drive unemployment? Is D tell me, tell me more. What uh, talk me through I your? I mean, people will have an alternative. So instead of working uh, uh -huh. um, on a field, for example, in a day, they would uh, they would just um, receive an equal amount of money to the amount that they would have gained while working. Yeah, w which is interesting. So this is a common concern around universal basic income programs. Is this is this what you're getting at? So that if you give somebody a universal basic income, it disincentivizes dis may disincentivize work. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I think the evidence suggests that it, that it that it that it doesn't as well. That that concern around dependency on on um, ongoing support doesn't doesn't play out in the um, in the literature. For this explicitly, what we're talking about as well is a one-off cash transfer. So um, uh, it, recipients would generally be using this to invest in one or two productive assets. So it actually, we actually see employment rates go up. We see productive hours go up. We see increases in um, income generating activities in people hiring neighbors, you know, people from it generally um, uh, increases. Uh, so what are the uh, main uh, targets? Like, so what are the main things that these people uh, spend those funds on? Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. So the, um, I don't know if I can go back to that slide. I'm probably going over time as well. <laughs> um, it's really, really varied, but you can see some of them. Um, oh, I, okay, okay. Yeah, uh, you can see some of them here, but it, it is varied. But generally, we see people invest. It varies uh, between countries and between programs, but roughly we see about 30% of the overall amount being spent on immediate needs, so on consumption or um, clothes, mm -hmm. yeah, basic immediate needs, and then we see about 70% going to kind of longer term productive assets. So this, this may be investing in a new business, this may be um, 
uh, purchasing additional inputs into an existing business, a lot spend it on um, education for their kids, uh, but some will spend it on a health need or something completely unpredictable. Some will have a uh, funeral cost that comes up just, you know, it's it's very, uh, very, very varied. Yeah, I see, because you mentioned before that, um, that uh, you, you thought was the solution, for example, to use some uh, higher barrier entry or to provide more funds for people that have um, undertaken uh, an entrepreneurship and uh, employment training, for example. I mm. think that's what you mentioned before. Um, so, is is there a chance for a, uh, for a, for more yeah. like for um, for more work on this aspect? So, for example, um, provide a, um, a customized course on employment for those people and how to reach them. Yeah. Also, right? Because I guess online education yeah. wouldn't work out that well, or maybe that's like the best solution to provide them with the devices to be able to like yeah. participate in one course uh, that relates um, to employment and uh, entrepreneurship uh, methods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I do think that there's more thinking. I think that there's more thinking to to be done on this for sure. It's something that. Um, we do look into and we consider whether you know you let recipients know of all of the other interventions and the training that is is available to them. Um, however, there is something at the core around the efficiency of giving cash transfers and relying on the fact that people then uh, the, the people will invest that however is most productive for them. So they may uh, pay it for higher education fees or they may uh, um, I, I spoke to w one woman who, um, she had a, a very, very small tailoring business, but she, with the cash transfer, she bought five, six more sewing the machines. She then trained um, a host of, of other young women in the neighboring village, and she set up a tailoring business. So it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, this is probably an exceptional case, right? So, so the question is how to um, how to make this case a replicate on a larger scale, right? How to motivate more people to use this money in a similar way. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I see, I see. I, I think, yeah, in the same. So uh, I know I'm conscious. We're probably at time, aren't we? We should c carry on the conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. some great questions obviously and I'm sure that other people also have some more things to discuss and some more queries probably and for that uh, you may find Rachel from 6 to 6 30 in discussion spaces um, so please feel free to grab her <laughs> and you know ask all your questions there and uh, swap card might look a bit packed for her uh, in that uh, in that time zone but still feel free to just um, you know go in there and uh, ask your questions. Um, also, uh, Rachel is doing another talk today in Ola at five from five to six p.m., uh, which is very similar, but might you might find some new details as well. So, if you want to join her, uh, please feel free to go for that one as well. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank please you. give her a Thanks huge so. round of applause, Thank guys. Thank you so much. Thank you.